Yeah, yeah. Cool. now it's important. All right. So, uh, before we move on uh, with the personal algorithm, let's see where we are. I posted over the weekend in a rush a note on Piazza, how many people have seen it, written by my hand. By now, you know that to recognize my handwriting, right? So, uh, that problem was a little bit of confusion. Uh, the way it's written is confusing. The way people discuss at office hours, they came to me and say, this is a binary, it's easy, right? I said, yeah, but why not? And then they, they wrote it down wrong. So th there is a, um, I want to clarify the problem, and I want to give you more time to do it. So if you, if you feel like you need another week to do that problem, that's fine. Uh, I'm not particularly keen on deadlines in general. I'm much more interested in you do the assignments uh, truly. Like if it takes more time and you need more help from the DAs, that's okay. My interest is that you're doing these assignments, not that you uh, get an A or B or C or whatever. From my point of view, everybody can get an A as long as they do the work, okay? So here's the problem. If I have K classes, or categories, or labels. It's like the red, blue, green, yellow, and black, right? That has to be five categories. And I'm classifying the data that way. Before the split, I'm counting the, the counts of these classes, right? So say, say I have T1 plus T2 plus T3 all the way to Tk. Those are counts of labels, right? how many uh, data points I have in each category. What's the entropy here? So the number of data points is obviously T1 plus T2 plus, plus Tk, right? That's the total number of images or patients or emails, whatever I have in my data set. And what's the entropy? Some, uh, Sum over i equal 1 to k of the probability of that class, which is ti divided by t, the total. That's the probability. It's the count of that label divided by the total. Log of 1 over the probability. How much is that? t divided by ti. That's the entropy before the split. Now. What the problem in part A say, if it's a binary tree, what does that mean? There's two branches. The split has two branches, not three, not five, two branches. So there's a branch left and there's a branch right. And every single data point must go left or right. There's no other option. So what's happening here, I have a different set of counts for labels, right? Everybody who was blue either goes this way or that way. So now I have L1, L2, up to LK counts. Those are counts of labels. And in here, each class or category or label has been split at R1, R2, up to 1K. Uh, with the understanding that Every T, T1 has to be L1 plus R1, right? Every, everyone who has category one either went left or went right. So the number of objects that went left L1 plus the number of objects that went right R1 has to be the total T1. That's true in general. Every TI must be Li plus Ri. What is the entropy at this node here? Same thing like in there. It's the sum from i equal 1 to k right, of li divided by l log of l divided by li. And what's the entropy here? Sum from i equal 1 to k r i by r log of r by r i. And now what's the entropy after the split? The weighted average. Weighted average, right? So that will be, what's the weight in here? L is the sum of Li, and R is the sum of Ri. And of course, T must be L plus R. The total number of things when some left, some right, the total is there. So
So entropy after the split is L divided by T, say L plus R, T, of this entropy, sum of I equal 1 to K, L I by L, log of L by L I, plus R, the other side, L plus R, sum of I equal 1 to K, uh, R I divided by R, right? Log of R divided by R I. That's the entropy after the split. So what is this question asking? We know for sure most of you solved the other problem that we said uh, it's easy to show that this entropy, no matter how you split, even if you split at random, it's always smaller than that entropy. Any split will decrease the entropy, even if it's a random split. Right. So uh, a lot of you got, got into the, OK, uh, the difference in entropy is who? If H before, right? So sum of I equal 1 to K of uh, Ti by T log of T by Ti minus the entropy after, that is L by T. T sum from I equal 1 to K uh, Li by L log of L by Li minus R by T sum of I equal 1 to K uh, Ri by R log of R by Li. That's the difference in entropy. And what we've said, and it's relatively very easy to prove, is that this thing is always the entropy always decreases, meaning what? The one before minus the one after, it's got to be great answer. Now that's easy to prove. The problem's not asking this. The problem's asking that this difference, this, let's say, minus, put a plus in here, call it like that, but this difference, this is before and this is after. If you have a binary split, you cannot decrease more than so what the problem is asking is saying that this cannot be, this difference cannot be greater than one. In binary case, of course, if you have more branches, you can decrease the form. So my, yes? Uh, you asked in the homework to show that that decrease could never be greater than one bit. Um, so should that be two? And we should assume that this decrease would not be uh, the no, it's one. The reason it says bits in there is because typically entropy, the units of entropy are bits. Okay. So the entropies themselves are measured in bits. If you take a class, which you should, if you have the chance, of information theory that deals with entropies, communication, rates, compressions, it's everything measured in bits. That's why I say one bit. So if I have um, one, if I have a label that has a 0.5 probability and another label that has a 0.5 probability, the entropy of the parent node being it's one. It's one, not uh, 0.5 times log over uh, log two. I thought the I thought the sums would the sum of the parent node would come to one if so I have two labels. So how much if I have p equals 0 0.5? One minus p is also 0 0.5. Right. Right. The entropy of this distribution, which is p one minus p, right? How much is that? It's one half log over that, okay. right? plus one half log over that. How much is this? One. Oh, okay. One. Well, two. Now, that's the case of effectively, if if I have only two slots, p and one minus p, that corresponds to what case in here? K equal k equal two, right? At k equal 2, this problem is trivial. That's what thing most of you submitted. k equal 2, right? easy, right? Why is the problem trivial? The entropy before the split is already at most 1. Right? This is the maximum entropy. Entropy is maximum when the distribution is uniform. We said that, remember? Uniform distribution causes the maximum entropy. What's the minimum entropy? Zero. 
the most skewness, the one when one class has 100% and all the other classes are zero. That's very skewed. So that has a zero entropy. If this maximum entropy is one, in general, what's the max entropy of a distribution with k things? That would be one over k, one over k, one over k, one over k. If I apply this formula, I'll be sum over one over k log of k over one, which is Okay. The maximum entropy of k things is log of k. All these logs are binary logs, or log base two. So if you say in this problem, hey, I'm going to solve the binary case, uh, k equal two. There's two labels, sick and not sick, or, or you know, uh, white and black. Then this entropy is at most one. Of course, once I subtract something out of it, I'm going to get less than one. That's not what the problem is asking. That's why I'm saying you can have whatever things you need to fix this. Uh, you can overwrite the old submission, or you can just submit another one. Doesn't matter. The problem is not saying there are only two classes. That would be a trivial problem. The problem is saying there are many classes potentially, but only two branches. Of the tree. All right. Um, so. That being said, I put there two possible ways to start this problem. This problem, uh, it's not a trivial problem. So it's not like, okay, we got here, we apply a simple inequality, boom, and we solve the problem. That's gonna take some time. That's what I'm saying, I'm not keen on the deadlines, but I want you guys to at least try to solve it. I'm willing to give a lot of partial credit for whoever tries the math, but you know, they can do it. Uh, I'm willing to help people out of this house. My interest, again, is not what grade you get in the end, but rather how much progress can you make in understanding entropies and decision to space. So I put two hints on Piazza. One is to try to grind those formulas in some way to inequalities. Uh, you should know that logarithm is a concave function. We said this, the opposite of complex. So the logarithm has the following property. If you take two points, x and y, and you take their average of weighted average, this would be alpha x plus one minus alpha y. It's, a, it's some, some, any point in between, it's an average. So let's call this z. The logarithm in here, it's bigger than the average of the logarithms. Right? So this point in here is the logarithm of alpha x plus one minus alpha y. And this point in here is who? The average of, this is log of x, that's log of y. This in here is log of x times alpha plus one minus alpha times log of y, right? Concave functions have the property that the log of the average is bigger than the average of the logs. The easiest way to see this is with alpha and one minus alpha, one half, one half, but it works for any linear combination of x and y. And it's true for all concave functions, all functions that kind of do not hold water in, in, in popular terms. So that inequality might come in handy, but you have to figure out how to apply it here. The other way, the other hint that I, I started on Piazza there and I, I didn't push it through was to think of the entropy as an expected value. So the entropy is the expected value. Think of the entropy formula, right? Is uh, pi, right? Sum over pi, log of one over pi, right? So expectations are usually uh, sum over all possibilities, right? Of the probability of that possibility. Right, so let's say probability of event i times the value of, uh, of i. Right, that's how expectations formula looks like. If you if you've seen expectations, then some values like age or salaries or events, and then says sum up all the possibilities of the values weighted by the probability. That's the average, right? So in our case, uh, the probabilities are those pi's here. 
what is the value that I'm taking the expectation of? To get this formula. So again, the probability are here. This is some expectation over some value. What is this value that causes entropy as a result? The number of, uh, the number of elements uh, belonging to a class on the right. I'm just, I'm just looking directly at this formula. If I have the probability as the expected, in the expected value, what should those values be to get that formula? Yes. Log of 1 over pi. Right, so this is expected value of log of 1 over pi. That is the entropy. Uh, this is very important quantity in information theory. Log of 1 over pi corresponds to encoding length. Like if you were to build a code that encodes certain characters or certain events or whatever, how many bits or how many characters you want to use for each event is dictated by the probability of that event. The, the rare the event is, the more bits it's going to take to encode, exactly following the logarithm formula. Now, irrespective of that, if you think of all these entropies as expected values, you're going to have to define a random variable. So I'm going to have some xi, a random variable, that is log of 1 over pi. This is a random variable. Of course, it's random because what's the random part in here? The i, right? Is it the first i equal 1 or i equal 2 or i equal 3? The random variable is well defined. It's log of 1 over the probability. But which class is it? 1, 2, 3, up to k, that's the randomness part. So the expected value of that random variable is going to be exactly the entropy. I'm, I'm going to need three random variables, one here, one here, one here. And there's a relationship between them because of split. And then I have to use something related to expected values. The property that I need to use is expected x plus y, it's always Expected of x. Do I need any condition for this to be true? Is it, is it always true or is it only true sometimes? There was something, right? Like some property requires x and y to be independent. Is that one of them? Or it's not applied to applicable here? Hmm. There's another one. E of x, y is E of x times E of y. How does this work? This is one of the things that we need to go back and recap quickly. What? I don't want to go that far. I'm saying, is this true all the time? No. When is it true? When x and i are independent. How about this one? Is this true all the time? Yes. Expectation distributes over addition all the time. It doesn't matter if the variables are dependent, independent, it doesn't matter. So that's why I don't have to worry about it. I can use this equality here for any x and y variables that I define. So that's a second approach to this problem. To define those random variables, use the expectation. But either way, it's going to take some math. Okay. Uh, I apologize for the people ask this question before at office hours, and they say, "Can I use binary? It's easy." And I, I wasn't present enough to say, "Okay, you're on the wrong track here." So for those people, you gotta have to rework this problem. Some of you didn't do it. Uh, please attack the problem. I'm more interested in in seeing what you understand of it than the actual points. How many points do I get? How much my grade depends on? All right, so that uh, is one thing. The second thing that I think we, since we're here, it's worth doing. How about that uh, other convexity problem? How many people have done that? So there was two problems there. There's a convex hull or a bunch of points, x1, x2, xn, uh, right? It's a convex hull of those points. 
the convex hull, think about geometrically, it's spinning this point. These are some of the excites, right? That's how it works, is the coverage. But some of them might be inside. Those inside the convex hull don't, don't expand the hull at all. Only the points outside expand the convex hull. And there's another convex hull of the yi point. Again, some of the wires might be inside. The problem, that problem is asking for two things. One, if they're linearly separable, that is, if there is some, this is a separation type of plane. If there is a plane like that, that leaves one on one side and the other one on the other side, then the convex hulls do not intersect. So the intersection is the empty set. Well, it's kind of e easy to show and easy to see. If there is some separation, it's not possible that there is a point common to those sets. If there would be a point, by contradiction assumption, you know, if there would be a point, that point would have to be on the left side of the plane and on the right side of the plane, which is impossible. Now, linearly separable may seem easy visually speaking. There is a line between them. But you have to define a more formal way to think of linearly separable. Because that's not too easy to see if you have many dimensions. Those are vector in D dimensions. You can see a separation in 2D and in 3D, but what about in 6D? What is the separation? Hard to see with your eyes. So linearly separable means there is a vector w. This plane is the w x equals 0 plane. And separable means the left side, any, any x, has the property w x i, this is the dot product, say it's negative. And for any y, w y i is positive. That's what it means linearly separable. There is a, a hyperplane there that leaves all the points, all the x points on the one side and all the y points on the other side. The other problem, this is very easy by contradiction. The other problem is that if the convex hulls uh, do not intersect, then they are linearly separable. This is a little bit more involved problem, although not as involved as this one. Here, you have to find the hyperplane W. The easiest way to approach this problem is to somehow construct a hyperplane W that does the separation. Convexity, the fact that convex hulls are convex by definition, is critical in here. This is not true if the two sets are not convex. There are two sets that are non-convex, that they don't intersect yet they are not linearly separable. I give this example to some of you at office hours. If my sets are not convex, they don't intersect, right? but they have no way to separate them with the plane. So in this construction of W and the proof, convexity must come in there. If you don't use convexity, means that you're missing something, because it's not true for non-convex sets. So people have tried to construct this W. Take a point in here, the one that looks closest to the set, drive a plane to it, see if that's the separation plane, that plane doesn't work, move it a little bit, things like that. There are two approaches to this problem. One that's very geometrical, that says um, construct a plane that passes through here that somehow is as far as possible to this set and show that that plane produces a separation. Or, this separation here does not allow for equality, but if I'm driving the plane through exactly this point, I have to allow one of them to be, which is okay, it doesn't change the problem. The other approach to this problem is, what I'm gonna segue into, is the perceptron idea we've done last time. That perceptron 
the linear separable of the first electron was an uh, idea that worked little by little, just like gradient descent, right? Every time you make some mistakes, move the plane a little bit. Make another mistake, move the plane a little bit. So can you start with the plane in here, some plane, and say, if it's linearly separating the two sets, great, I'm done. If not, move the plane a little bit to see if you can separate them. And then if not, move it a little bit, a little bit. That's more of a computer science solution. In here, you could have a pure math solution by driving the right plane and show linear separability. So with that in mind, let's keep talking about the perceptron. Let's see how that works. That's what we learned last time. we say so far about the perceptron? We said um, here is the space. Say 3D space. And we have some plus points. Plus, plus, plus vectors. Vector means data objects because data objects are a vector of, of feature values, right? Then we have some uh, minus points. Let's say here's one, it's a minus. And here's another one, it's a minus. And here's uh, another one that's a minus. And we want to separate them. Same thing like in there. We would like to drive a hyperplane. This will drive to the origin as it is, the simple version. Uh, to leave the, the pluses on one side and minus on the other side. So we would like to say for any y, so data point is x, y. If y is positive, uh, we want uh, data point wx. So this is a hyperplane here. Uh, we want wx to be positive. And if y is negative, then uh, we want wx to be negative. That's, that's the type of thing we want. Then we said to do this first step, uh, if y is negative, uh, rewrite the point xy, which is xy equal to minus 1, to minus x and minus y equal plus 1. So the first thing we said, we're going to move the negative points on the positive side. So we don't like this point here. We're going to symmetrize it. Neg if this is x, the minus x will be exactly the opposite vector on the same line, just on the other side. Right? So this is corresponding to this one. right? This is minus x. And now the y is positive. right? If y was negative here, Y will be positive on that side. Take this one here, and okay, again, double line here. This is another minus x, with y is now positive. And this is a minus y, we make it here. Y positive. So now that I wrote these this points, the minus side, on that side, I can get rid of them. So by rewrite, I mean replace that point with the, the other one. If I do this, my task is now not to separate the minus and pluses, because I don't have minuses anymore. I move all the minuses to the plus side. So my task becomes what? A hyperplane such that Wx is always positive. So all points are on one side of the plane. Make sense? Yes. Yes. So is it like you 
you move it, and if it's not positive, you move the hydroplane so that it's Right, so the points, I only move the negative ones into the exact symmetric point. And then my task for finding the W that separates plus and minus, that W, that hyperplane, would be now a hyperplane that leaves all the points to one side. I still have to find the hyperplane, but I'm not separating anything. I'm saying all the points have to be on one side. So I'm trying to understand how does Wx, uh, how is Wx is the equation of the plane. So what, what does, for example, Wx is bigger than zero, what does that mean for a plane? It means they are on the plus side of the plane. Plus. So we the, w, the plane itself is the equation Wx equals zero. Every point that has a Doppler to W zero must be in the plane. Remember seventh grade definition of lines, geometry? How do people define a line in 2D? Ax plus b. Y equals zero, right? Yes. Right, so that's if the line passes through a region. Was Ax plus by equal some c for lines that do not pass through the origin, right? So in 2D, that's a good idea. How about we do this in 2D first? A line, any line, is some ax plus by plus c equals 0. But if I force the line to pass through a region, it's just ax plus by, let's say x1 and x2 equals 0, right? The same thing happened in 3D. Any plane in 4D and 5D, any hyperplane is defined by a linear combination of coordinates has to be equal to zero if the plane passes through the origin. But if it's not origin, then it's not going to be zero. There has to be a bias. If the plane doesn't pass through origin, it passes through some other point that has to be a bias. In this case, the simple version, we only consider planes that pass through the origin. And here we also define which is positive part, which is negative. That's side. simply by, by negating the W's. If I have a plane, if I want to keep the hyperplane but reverse the sides, say that's now my negative side and that's the positive side, what do I have to do with those W's, the coefficients? Multiply them by minus one. If I take my coefficients, in this case A and B, and I say I want the same line but with reverse plus and minus sides, that would be minus AX minus B X2. So that will be the same line, except the, the sides have now reversed. Hands up, this would be yes. Okay. So when we start uh, to find uh, the hyperplane for the first time, we check, uh, so are we performing any translation or there's no translation in the beginning? Translation as of? Uh, of the plane, of the hyperplane. You mean move it away from the origin? Correct. No. We, we, we stick with the origin, I'm going to explain why. But we, we do the minuses, we, we symmetrize the minus points in the beginning. So before we start finding the plane, we, we're not looking for a really a separating plane because first of all, we move all the points to the positive side and our separation becomes, just find your plane that leaves all the points to one side. Now, hands up who's with me on this linearity of what does it mean to have a line or a plane and what does it mean to have a plus side and a minus side. It's zero is when it's on the line or on the plane. There's a plus side if it's positive, it's not negative. This is fundamental for some algorithms. If you, if you, for example, took algorithms, uh, some of you did, and you <coughs> studied a simplex algorithm for, for, for optimization, or integer linear programming, or something like this. This idea of understanding what, what is the line doing, where's the plus side, where's the minus side, and so on and so forth, is critical for the kind of problem. <coughs> so we had the uh, linear programming, integer programming, the simplex algorithms, all these would require a lot of deep understanding of how lines work. And they're all linear because it's a combination of the coordinates or the points. There's no x squared or x1 times x2 in there. That would not be linear anymore. So I'm just asking to make sure. So this, when when the plane's equation is w is equal to zero, it, it can be tilted. It can be any orientation. Right? It, it can be tilted. Be yeah. No, it can be. Exactly. The only thing is w x equals zero means it passes through origin. Why it passes through origin? If I put x equals zero, what do I get? Zero. Zero means the pass. The zero is part of the plane. If I want a plane that doesn't pass through origin, it has to be wx plus b equals zero. 
B is the bias, how much off for the originates? Right? Yes. And when you say you are negating the data point, you are negating the whole vector, right? That's right. The whole vector. Yeah. So any point that was here, x becomes minus x on the outside, and the label from minus becomes a plus. And only those that are negative and right. So my point is to put all the points on that side. Okay. How do you uh, uh, how do you decide what's negative? They can be all over. The points come with labels. Okay. So I have the oh, y's. Oh. I just look at the y's and say whoever's negative symmetrizes to the other side. That's that's irrespective for whatever plane I'm have my hands on. Yeah. Like be, before I even look at any plane, I look at what are y's negative and move them on the other side. All right. I know some of you are thinking, why are we doing all this, right? Like, okay, sounds interesting, right? Like, I remember geometry from like 20 years ago, and I, I, was, I was good at it, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but what's the point of all this? Like, linear regression would be better than any person drawn, right? Like, who is the person drawn out with? You gotta give me some credit and wait a little bit to get there, okay? Apart from the usefulness of building more interesting things to those person drawn, this is an amazing exercise for understanding linearity and gradient descent anyway, right? So I mean, pedagogically speaking, it's better to understand gradient descent on this perceptron than on linear regression. On linear regression, it's harder to track every single uh, update rule of gradient descent and figure out why did it do that? Why, why am I better now than I was before? Of course, you can run regression. You maybe already run it, gradient descent, and you call the sky kit learn package. It's going to give you a very good regression line. But what happened internally, it's more easy to follow here. OK, so now I have that. Uh, I also have a loss. So now my plane, I want, I, I'm going to redraw this picture. My task now is, OK, I have a 3D space. So I can see it. And now all the points are in the plus side. I are not on the plus side. All the points have a plus label, right? So I have a bunch of points here, there. Plus, 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 plus. And my job is to find a hyperplane that leaves all these points in one side. Again, I can reverse the sides. I don't have to worry about which side is it. As long as I find a plane here, passes through the origin, so it, is, it includes these points. And all the plots, all the points, all the vectors are on one side of the plane. That is, all the wx are positive. If I find such a plane, that plane will separate the pluses from minuses, right? Because all the pluses are on that side, and all the minuses, when I reverse it, they're automatically on this side. If a hyperplane passes through a region, any reverse of a point must be on the other side of the plane. Right? This is a plane. Any vector that goes this way or that way, that way, doesn't matter. When I reverse this vector, since the origin is on the plane, what's going to happen? It's going to go on the other side of the plane. It doesn't matter how the plane is oriented. Any orientation the plane has, it's guaranteed when I reverse the vector, I'm getting on the other side of the plane. So when I put those pluses that have been symmetrized back to the minus side, if they were on the plus side, then I have to be on the minus. Again, that's because the hyperplane passes through the origin. Uh, so why I don't need to move the hyperplane off the origin here? Because all the vectors are vectors that are starting from the origin. Whatever the coordinates are of the data points, right? I'm going to say, OK, that's corresponding to a vector from 0 to something. So vectorially speaking, in geometry, I have those segments all coming from this one. So I'm going to define a loss. That is how good a hyperplane is. If somebody gives me a hyperplane, how good is it? Uh, that's going to be the sum over all the data points misclassified so that is for all the points that wx is negative right because i want to leave all the points on the positive side a bad point or an error means it's negative 
for all of these, I'm going to do uh, minus Wx. So this loss is definitely positive, right? Because I'm only summing the point that have a negative quantity. And for those points, I'm putting a minus in front of it. So it's guaranteed to end up positive. And again, this only looks at errors. That is the x points on the wrong side. Notice that this loss does not include the points that I got correctly. It doesn't give me any price or any reward for getting something right. The stuff that's correctly done doesn't count for the loss. That's not true in regression, right? In regression, that square loss, I mentioned this before, that's a very important aspect of regression. Do we remember the square loss in regression? If my problem is classification, say, 0, 1, I can match the 1, and then I get the 0 loss. But what happens if h of x is bigger than 1, 1 1.5 or 2 or 3? In many cases, that's actually good. That shows more confidence. My score was way over 1, then I, I'm confident it's in the positive side. Yet the regression is going to give me a penalty, right? It's going to say, you are too big in here. In here, if I get something correct, and no problem, doesn't matter where it is, that doesn't count. But it does count to get something in the wrong side. For the wrong side, there is a quantity. This is not a black and white loss. The more negative it is, the more it's on the wrong side, right? Wrong side means here. That's an error. Because now this point is a plus clearly on the wrong side. The more on the wrong side it is, the more the loss is going to increase, right? If it's a little bit, on the on the wrong side, this is going to be a small quantity. But if it's far away from the plane, it's going to be a big one. All right. So uh, actually, I like this error point. I'm going to draw it a little different. Let's say here is an error. So now, uh, what happens if I take the differential of this thing? This is something that we've done already with vectors. Uh, we can decompose these differentials into, this is a vector, but we can do it per component. It's much simpler than the ones we did before, right? It's easy to see that if I take the differential respect to w, I'm going to get the sum remains a sum, like in a differential, and I'm going to get something with x there, right? By applying the mechanic from the unidimensional, right? W times a constant, when you take the differential respect to W, you get that constant back. Minus is the minus. Now transpose is just because how differentials work in multidimensional. You get the differential of this to be X transpose, but that doesn't matter for X. If you want to say minus X, that's fine too. The transpose is just to make the matrix operations work correctly. I won't insist on this because we did some discussion about these differentials when we did the logistic regression. It's a lot easier than that. So how is this an update rule, gradient descent? Remember gradient descent, right? It says if your uh, current x is not good, I take the differential. If the differential is 0, you're good. Right? If not, we do an update. What's the update? It's always the same update. The update was the new is the old. 
times the differential of the loss function, which is in my case, it's plus, right? Because the differential has a minus sign. Uh, lambda is the learning rate. So again, the transpose, uh, I'm not worried about it informally. It's just that the operation has to work. If, if this W old, what's the, what's the size of W? Right, so this is 1D, right? And this also has to be 1D, otherwise 1 times D, 1 times D. This, this won't work, right? To, to do this addition correctly, this size of the matrix here has to be 1 times d. So the transpose is there just to make the operation work correctly. Otherwise, you couldn't add a row vector with a column vector. It doesn't work. So now, that's where my actually the main point of doing the perceptrons in this class. What does this do, geometrically speaking? So let's assume we only have one error. One error. So there's only one, one point that's an error. So x is an error. Let's take lambda equal one. Of course, lambda is a learning rate. We can push it more or, or less. What does it mean to say w new, w old? What does this update rule becomes? That, that's what it does. So I want to understand what does this mean geometrically. Of course, this is a gradient descent formula, and the more you apply it, it eventually, presumably, you get to some convergence point. Fine. But what does it mean geometrically? Who's W? The hyperplane is not W. The hyperplane is what? Again, it's all the points with the property W times X equal. That's, a, that's the plane. The plane is all the points who have a dot product of W equals zero. But what about the vector W itself? Where is that? Somebody else. Let's give somebody a So if I am to look at W as a vector, where in the picture is that W? some line, say this one here. This is what you want to say? Or something. Right. So the, the, the W is the vector perpendicular to the plane of some length. Length is the norm of W, which we say will be the other norm. We're not concerned about the length right now, whatever it is. Why is this perpendicular to the plane? Like, you know, if this is my plane, the origin is somewhere in there. We already said all the all those planes pass into the origin. W got to be perpendicular on the plane in the origin point. Now, if this is my plane, then W has to stick out like this. And if this is my plane, W has to be like this. Why is this? Because of the definition of a dot product, and if it's perpendicular, if you take the dot product, it'll be zero. Because who are the points? who have the dot product equal zero in geometry. Two vectors have a dot product equal zero when? <coughs> Where the angle between them is 90 degrees. What if the angle is smaller than 90 degrees? The dot product is? Positive. And if the angle is bigger than 90 degrees, the dot product is? Why is that? So cosine, right? So what's the cosine between two lines, two vectors? Here's a vector, say, x, and here's a vector, y. The cosine between x and y is what? It's the dot product, right? That's x times y in vectorial form, divided by normal of x times normal of y. That's the length of them. So if they normalize to length 1, there is no denominator. <coughs> Remember cosine? Ninth grade, tenth grade, something like that, right? That's how it worked? Yeah. So this is actually also validating the sides. Think about it. If the angle is smaller than 90 degrees, 
aka the cosine is positive. positive. Where is that vector? If the angle between the normal, this is called the normal to the plane. Where is the vector, the angle smaller than 90 degrees? The point has to be on the same side with W. Every point that has Wx positive, it means the angle between the point and W is smaller than 90 degrees, which means that vector has to be on the same side of the plane with W. On the other hand, this one here, if the Wx is negative, because it's on the other side of the plane, it means the angle between this and W, the normal, has to be more than 90 degrees. Hands up, who's with me? Good. OK, so we understand where this W is. It's a normal to the plane. It's a perpendicular of some length, which is the Euclidean length. Not concerned right now with that. What is this doing, geometrically speaking? Somebody else. So if I do this, I'm moving the plane, right? The plane is the perpendicular to normal. So actually, I'm moving who? I'm moving the normal. I'm moving the W, right? That's what this update says. You got to move that W somehow. Of course, when I move the, the W, W forces the plane to move, right? If this is my W, when I'm moving the, 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 the perpendicular, the plane will, will rotate too, right? Because this W remains always perpendicular. So if I say move the W that way, that forces the plane to move that way. So what is this saying? Move the, take the W out and add this vector to it. So here's W. And how do we add the vector to it? Geometrically speaking, what does it mean add the vector to it? Find the result. Somebody, yes. We translate it there and the resultant vector is your address. So this, this is the x that I'm adding. I'm taking w, right? I'm putting the x here, right? The same, the same vector translated. And I'm saying w plus this vector, this vector is pointing this way, right? W plus this, that's my new W here. This is W new. This is W old. So I'm adding that vector to the plane. So that's my W. So what happened to the plane? Plane was here, perpendicular to the old W. What happens now with the plane? It moves, right? So my new plane might be something in here like that. Now this new plane is perpendicular to the new W. Am I guaranteed now that this point is on the plus side? If I, if I add this, I do this operation, I'm adding this x, the error. W was moved. Can I tell for sure that this point is not on the negative side? Is it can get to the positive side? No. I'm not promising that. But did I move at least in the right direction? So again, what happened here? I had the perpendicular, and I had the misclassified point. I, by adding that point, do I move the W towards the misclassified point? So that misclassified point, it may still misclassify, but it's now closer to the plane, which means it's not as badly misclassified as it was before. So intuitively, you can see on this example how gradient descent actually moves towards a better classification. Remember, my overall goal was a plane that has all the points on the plus side. So by moving towards the point the normal, it rotates the plane in a way that the misclassified point is definitely closer to the hyper plane. Maybe it already passed to the positive side. So now we want to quantify that. Yes? Uh, I don't know if the misclassified point remains misclassified because uh, if you are considering only two vectors, then the misclassified point uh, for the last point can lie on the vector, right? Lie on the hyperplane. Lying on the hyperplane, we can consider it as correct. So let's suppose our objective is uh, we want all the points to be maybe greater or equal than zero. So I'm, I'm not, I don't want to make a big deal about this exact, whether they can be zero or not. Maybe we can tilt the hyperplane a little bit more to not have points on it. But this is not essential for the problem. The problem is if I have misclassified points, where they end up after the update. So in 2D, 
in 2D. I, I have a plane, right? A line. I have a line. That's the normal to the line. And I have a point that say um, it's in here. That's my x on the other side of the line. What happens if I'm adding this x here? This is my w nu. So the w nu, this is the origin point. This is now w nu. The, the, the line now, the next. the line is going to be perpendicular in the origin here, it's still misclassifying that point, right? This is the wx old line, and this is the wx new line. But the point is closer to the line now. So it's not a guarantee that if I do this, even for one point, I'm updating. But can I update again? What's going to happen if I update again? This is my W. What am I adding to the, this W to move it again? The same point, right? So I'm adding the same point again. It's going to be the same vector, right? This is the vector. Anywhere I translate this vector in the plane remains the same vector. So I translated the first time in here. So I went this way. Now I'm here. This is my W nu. I'm moving the point again here. So what's going to happen with W now? This is my, let's call W0. This is W nu 1. And this in here. W new 2, right, after the second update, what about the line now? It's going to classify this eventually correct, right? I think you can see this. If I add that vector enough times, say k times, what is my W going to be? The original W plus k times x, right? Because I'm adding x plus x plus x plus x k times. Eventually, this vector is going to be looking more and more like in the x direction, right? Whatever w is, if I add enough x's, think about it. This is w, 0, and this is x. This is 2x. This is 3x, 4x, kx, right? Eventually, if I add W to this thing, it's going to look similar to the X direction. And everything that's on the X direction, of course, any line that's perpendicular. So when I add this W here, this is my X W plus KX, right, this vector. The line, the more and more and more is going to be perpendicular or look closer to be perpendicular to X, which means X got to be classified on the correct side. Now, that's an intuition for one point. We want to make this argument for many points, right? Because we, we don't. We may have more than one point misclassified. Now, initially, I may have 20 points misclassified. But as I classify them correctly, I'll have less points misclassified, right? Maybe the next round, I get one of these 20 to work correct, and the other 19, I still have to update for. Can it happen the other way? I make an update, and some of the points that are correctly classified become misclassified now? Yes. yes, it can happen. So I'm not guaranteed to decrease the number of points that are misclassified. I may start with 20, next round I have 18, then 16, then back to 18, right? Because some of the points I move the plane too much. Okay. So we're going to assume that this is linearly separable, meaning there is a plane that does the job. We, 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 our job is to find it, but we're not considering cases where it's impossible to separate the vectors. So we have a little proof of convergence here. So this is very easy to implement, right? I mean, if we use gradient descent for logistic regression, all you have to change is this update rule to add up the points that are misclassified. That's extremely easy to do, right? Yes. Question? Oh, yeah. So uh, in uh, gradient descent and Gaussian regression, we were doing the differentiation, so we knew that it was going towards convergence. But here you're telling that it's not. In here I'm saying you can see how for one data point, the update definitely helps. And eventually, it's going to classify that point correctly. Your question is, yeah, but if I have many points misclassified, overall I applied this enough times. 
am I guaranteed to get that plane that classifies everything correctly? I think that's what you're asking. Yeah. Of course, that only makes sense if it's possible. Like if the data set was not linearly separable to start with, no plane will separate them whatsoever. Doesn't matter how many gradient descent updates I do. So our theorem is the answer to this question. If x plus and x minus, that is x with y equal plus and x with y equal minus, are linearly separable, the perceptron algorithm based on gradient descent update W nu equal W all plus the sum learning rate, the sum of X misclassified, that is WX negative. This, repeating iteratively this update, eventually uh, separates the data. Eventually, I mean in finite number of steps. This is something uh, I don't want to talk about yet. In mathematics, when you say something's going to happen, it may be at the limit it's going to happen. And that, that doesn't actually happen for real. Is it At that limit, it converges to one, but it never reaches one. In here, we're much more interested in a concrete thing. It has to converge in a finite number of iterations, like after 100 or 200 iterations. Okay. So here's what we're going to do for this proof. We're going to say, uh, here's the W0, and let's say the W1, W2, uh, WK, WK plus 1 at the updated hyperplane normals. So each WK plus 1 is the WK plus lambda sum over X being error. That means specifically WK X has to be negative. It's error for what plane? For WK. Error for So every one of them has been updated this way. Um, let's assume, uh, actually let's write this here, a linear separable. This means there exists some sort of W, magic W, right, that does the separation. We, we don't know who that is, but linear separable means there is a W that does it. So that means W times X is positive for any X, right? Remember, I've already swapped the negative into the positive side. So I don't have negative points anymore. So there is a W like this. Uh, it's the separator. But I don't, I don't know which one it is. I just know it exists one. Again, if it wouldn't exist such a W, I'm trying to do something impossible, right? I wouldn't be able to separate the data with any algorithm. So let's assume there is some W. The trick in here is to look at what is the um, WK plus 1 minus some beta. What is the norm of this thing? I think we can use lambda equal 1. I'll get back to this. If that doesn't work, we'll have to fix it. But let's just say the upgrade rule is very simple. It's the one that just adds the vector to the normal. We may have to fix this lambda. In here, um, 
you may not, I'm not sure how much math you did different. You guys have usually different backgrounds in mathematics. This is a proof that's saying, I don't know W. So that's one thing that may be hard to swallow if this is the first time you see that sort of proof. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get close to something I don't know what it is. I'm just going to show that it's getting closer and closer and closer until it's close enough. But I, at no time I can say I know W by. And this beta is a parameter that I'm putting in my proof that it's fixed beta. So constant, sorry. TBT means what? So I'm putting a constant that if you've seen those recurrence proofs with the constants, you know, when I'm trying to prove some recurrence by induction, there is a C in there, right? And I'm doing the whole proof with that C. And only at the end, I fix the C to what I need. So this is the kind of constant that I know it's a constant, so it's not going to change. But I don't know right now what that constant is going to be. I'm going to decide it later what that constant is. So that's another thing that if you've never seen this kind of proofs, it might be hard to swap. All right. So what is this? This is a distance between my current W, or the new W, and some scaled W bar. So if this is my W bar, beta W bar might be here, right? Or here, depending how big beta is. Beta is going to say, OK, how long do you want to go on this W axis? So what is this? This is going to be, I'm going to replace WK plus 1 with WK plus this sum here. Right? And uh, I'm going to get Say lambda equal one, so let's just not have a lambda here. This is for right? So lambda equal one would make this lambda go away. Now let's see how this works out. Uh, if I open a square. I'm going to open it by looking at terms. This is one term, and that's the other term. So it's going to be Sexes are the ones for each I've got arrows before, right? So how does this work now? I want to say this is smaller or equal than So 
The minus and which one is the yes, plus? Two x k. This is the minus, and this is the plus. Okay. So who is x k? Uh, the nodes have it without a sum. You do it for one data point, but we can do it with a sum. So these x k's, uh, we should call them. It's the sum over all x's with the property w k x is more than zero. So who are those points? The ones that are misclassified at round k, right? So those would be a different set of points from round to round. At round k plus 1, I may have a different points that are misclassified. So I'm going to call them xk like this. I'm summing over some data points that are misclassified. So xk is the x errors at round So that is the points again for which WKX is is not necessary here. If you if you write something very clear in there, uh, this is all, only the sum of points with the property WKX is negative. The, the, the trick here is that this is a different set of points at each iteration. Next iteration might be different points. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to say this is smaller than WK minus beta W bar. This is the first term. This, I say, this is positive. Sorry, this is negative. Because by definition, these points are the ones that are errors. So this times W has got to be a negative thing. This whole thing is negative. So if I don't put it, I get a bigger value or a smaller value? If I skip it, bigger value, right? So it's smaller than uh, plus the sum of this again, this is not all the x's. This is the ones that are errors at that point, right? Minus 2 beta sum over the errors here of xw. As you used to be the last term, uh, where does the second term come from? This? Yeah. This is this one. Oh, square. Right, square. Sorry. Right. My plan is to say now, I can find a beta such that this whole thing is negative. So I want a beta so big 
that such that this sum of the x d square minus two beta sum over the x of x w to always be negative. I don't care about the exact beta, whether it's a hundred, a thousand, or a million. I want to say there is a fixed beta, not something that changes, such that that thing is always negative. Why is this a little bit hard to swallow? This thing, it's over some x's, right? It's not the whole data set. It's only the x's that are misclassified at a point. So on one round, this might be only x17, right? Data point 17. At a different round might be x15, x25, and x34, right? At a different round might be a different subset of the points. Can I find a beta that says, look, whatever is that you have misclassified, any subset of the points, this sum of square would be smaller than 2 beta times sum of that. So first of all, is this a positive thing here? XW? Bar? Why? Because W is this magic hyperplane that classifies this correctly. So WX must be positive for any X, right? Can I find a beta big enough? Remember, my data set is finite. My x could be a million points, but there is a finite set of points. So I want to say, I want to find a beta so big that when I multiply with this positive thing, it beats any sum of squares in that data set. I think it's easy to see how it's just a matter of setting beta big enough. Because this is a positive quantity. So these x's are really a subset of the points, right? Here's my data set. And this is the axis I'm looking at, only some of them. Could be this axis, next round could be some other axis. And next round some other axis. But for any round, for any subset of x, I can compute the xw, that's positive. And I can compute the sum of the norms squared. And I only have to set up beta high enough that this is positive. This is negative with a minus sign. So, the task in here is for any x subset of data have the sum of the x square, the norms, be smaller than 2 beta sum of x w bar. Now, w bar in here, this is fixed. This is not moving with my updates. W bar is this magic W that I said in the beginning. So it's not moving with updates. And uh, I can take for any subset to see what's the sum of, there will be many subsets. But this is mathematics. This is not computer science. So even if it's exponential in nature, it doesn't matter. X times W, I check what the sum is. I check the sum of squares. Because this is positive, I can always find a beta big enough to do it. Yes, yeah. Is it, would it be the, the sum of x transpose square on the left side? Right. I think that's the same. Okay. Let's take the norm of x or x transpose, it's the same thing. That, that's correct. Right? The norm of x or x transpose is the same exact length. Well, I had a question. So what do you think is the maximum value that we can take? I don't care about that. This is a pure mathematical proof. It's not an algorithm. This is not a technique to do anything. We already have the technique. He's saying add these vectors to W and keep moving. This is a pure math proof that tries to say within a finite number of steps, we're going to get it done. So how many people believe me that I can find such a beta since this is a positive quantity and this is a positive quantity? I can find a beta that's so big that eventually this overwhelms that, even if it's for a subset. Right? We buy that? So if we can find such a beta, it means this whole thing here, it's smaller than, if this is a negative quantity, it's smaller than that. 
So it's more than WK minus theta W bar. So what did I start and what did I get? WK plus 1 minus beta W squared. The, 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 this is the difference between the two vectors, right? Beta W is this one. And W is this one. The difference is the distance from here to here squared. This is the W, my WK plus 1 minus W beta norm. And square is the, I have it square here, but the distance is helping to W square, right? So that's my distance. What is it saying? As you move to K to K plus 1, this difference between your vector, the normal, and B beta times W bar, those are both constants, W bar and beta. So that's a fixed thing, it doesn't move. What happens to this distance? Is decreasing, right? It's starting from whatever, and every time you move, the, the normal that you have, it's closer and closer to this beta W. Now, beta may be very big, right? Beta may be maybe hundreds or thousands. But geometrically speaking, as a direction, what does it mean? Beta W will always be on this direction of the direction of W bar, right? Even if it's a big beta, it's the same line. What does this distance mean? W has to be closer and closer and closer to that line. Is this guarantee that at some point, W, will classify points correctly? My WK, WK is a normal, the normal defines a plane. If W gets closer and closer and closer to W bar, is it eventually gonna classify the points correctly? Yes. Why? Because it actually will be indistinguishable from W bar. Right, even because W bar classifies the points correctly. Right, that's how we say it. And then if W, my W, my normal WK eventually gets to be so close to that bar, it's going to leave the points on the same side. It only showed that it was less than or equal to, couldn't it? I mean, we haven't ruled out the case where it's always the same. Right. right at so the equation is the finite number of steps, right? So, I mean, uh, first of all, um, What we would like to show is not only that this, this monotonically there's a, there's a direction here, that is WK in, improves, meaning it gets closer to the W bar, which is like the, the, the end result we want. Can it this decrease, the difference, can it decrease little by little by little, but never reach zero? So that, that's a question here, right? I start with some distance. Here's the distance between W0 and my beta W. It does decrease, but maybe it's decreasing so little, you know, you can have a small decrease, uh, eventually you add up to infinity and it still didn't get to zero. Can we prevent that from happening? Can we say, wait a minute, we don't want to decrease by epsilon and then half epsilon and then a quarter epsilon and so on and so forth, infinite number of steps of decreasing, but still didn't reach zero. How can we prevent that? The, the danger here is that it does decrease. It gets closer and closer and closer, but closer and closer and closer. We don't want to be an infinite number of steps that eventually never reach W bar times beta. Can we fix this a little bit more? Can we say, we say we want this to be negative, right? Can we say we want this to be at least zero, minus zero, at most minus 0 0.001. So we want this not to be negative, but to be smaller than minus 0 0.00001. So I don't want just to be negative, like arbitrarily close to zero, but I want to be within some little, little bound of zero. If I could do this, then this would be that minus Zero point zero zero zero. How many zeros are there? One, right? So then, guarantees that it decreases by at least an amount, 
that means within a finite number of steps, even if it starts at 100 million, if it always decreases by an amount, within a finite number of steps, you're going to reach zero. I was just confused. We had a less than or equal to right before the last step, and that should just be less than. This? Yeah. Well, once I have this, it's the same. Right. Well, well, once you have that, yes. So I want this decrease to happen at least a guaranteed, a small amount. Doesn't matter how small it is, but I don't want to be an arbitrary convergence to zero here, because that may cause an infinite number of steps. Can we possibly add some epsilon value there so that in the, so the way we find beta takes into account that epsilon and? Yeah, certainly. So if beta can be big enough to beat that, if I increase beta by a little bit, that's what you're saying, I'm going to achieve that amount. Remember, a lot of quantities here are fixed. X are fixes, W bar is fixed, beta is fixed. The only thing that's changing is the W is the normal. So I want this to be not just negative, but negative with a margin of error so that this decrease is guaranteed to not go forever. Because at this point, what can happen, right? If it's only guaranteed to decrease by this much, how many maximum iterations can I do? Whatever the amount is initially divided by this epsilon, right? And within that amount of iterations, this, uh, this square norm cannot go negative, right? So th this, this eventually this has to stop. When does it stop? This process cannot go on forever. At some point, it gets stuck. If it gets stuck, it's because of what reason? The update doesn't do anything. That's that's where, right, if, if, if the update leaves the W in the same position as it was before, I'm not, I'm not <coughs> changing anything, right? So how can this update be stuck? There's nothing misclassified. If there's something misclassified, the update will do something, right? Because misclassified means WX is negative, that means this x is not zero, so when I'm adding x, I'm changing the plane. What this proof shows is that this process cannot go on forever. Within a finite number of steps, the update must be irrelevant, meaning everything must be classified. So the final point, if this update gets stuck, it means all points on the positive side. So that means my W eventually creates a normal that its plane puts everything on the positive side. We're gonna, in machine learning, you're gonna see a lot of proof like this. I, on purpose, decided to make this course not about those kind of proofs. But the other sections, even at this level, 6140, do a lot more of those proofs. My choice is to not insist on math, but rather on data and implementations. But if you want to be a data scientist, sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with a lot of proofs like that. So I did one here. Maybe I'll do one later on, two, three proofs over the whole term. They won't be required for your grade. So I'm not going to ask you to reproduce proofs like this. But keep in mind that being a successful data scientist, it's, you're going to have to hit those proofs soon or at least understand them. When you read machine learning papers, if you go to a conference, 90% of the papers are proofs, mathematical proofs like that. So you got to be able to follow two things. In a proof, you got to first get the main idea. Forget about all the details. What is the plan here? What is the core idea? The core idea is to show that the distance between my normal and this magic correct normal, it's shrinking. And it's shrinking by an effective value so that it only takes a fine number of steps until it cannot shrink anymore. This is the infinite descent sort of proof. Induction is based on the same kind of ideas, right? If I start somewhere, I decrease my property, I decrease, 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 until I reach a base case. Same kind of idea. So some of the nodes have this proof done by induction. And then once you figure out the proof, idea says, what do I want to hear? I want to show that this decreases. You got to see, OK, how it this decreases? It relates wk plus 1 to wk. And then it breaks this into some square forms. And then it uses two facts. The fact that errors have this thing always negative. That's why they're errors. 
and the fact that W have the Dothraque always positive because errors are misclassified by WK, but all points are correctly classified by WY. So this Dothraque is always positive, this one's always negative, and there is a little bit of math arithmetics there to figure out how to put it all together. All right, you guys are gonna have to implement the perceptron algorithm, which is much easier than the proof itself. But then, what we're we gonna do next time, we should have started uh, now, but we're not gonna have time to start now. I wanna show you something that we're gonna do next time. I wanna show you this now because there's a pertinent question, okay, what, what are those perceptron doing? Why do I need to worry about them? So here's what we're gonna do next time. Next time, we're gonna create perceptrons, but then on top of them, we're gonna create more perceptrons, and more perceptrons, and we're gonna call that a neural network. Neural networks are extremely powerful algorithms, meaning they can match almost any separation surface of any kind and functions, but also they're not convex, so they're hard to train. It's not easy to get those weights, Ws for a neural network. We're gonna have a lot more in here, See, this is my input, x1, x2, and so on and so forth. Each one of these is a perceptron to a point. But I have now two perceptrons, one from the input, this is x1, x2, to this guy, and another perceptron to this guy. And from here, I get another perceptron to the output. And if I wanted to have another layer, I could say, uh, you know, here's have more layers of perceptrons, right? Build on top of each other. And in here I could have more perceptrons, and in here more perceptrons. And I can start building these hierarchies right from the input layer, which are the features. Connect perceptrons together. And everywhere I know how many weights are from here to this guy. Three weights, right? Excluding the bias terms. How about from here to here? Three weights. From here to here. Three weights. From here, now this level, suppose it's only two. How many weights are from here to here? Two, two weights, two weights, two weights. And then from here I have five, five to here, five weights. So there's a lot of weights in this network here that all need to be updated with gradient descent somehow. So there has to be a mechanism to do the updates forward and backwards through this network. That can get complicated. And I have a data set. Say so here's my data set, right, to separate this. Uh, I can run this and uh, when I run this network, it does the updates back and forth, all these gradient descent updates, and it shows me which weights are big. Like you can see some weights have no weight at all, and some weights are bold, that means that weight is relatively big. So there are many packages implementing neural networks. Your next homework is going to be to do two problems in two ways, so there's four problems there. One way is to use a package. We support one package, very popular, TensorFlow, but you can use any package. There are many neural network packages and you can use whichever one you want, but the ACE will help you with TensorFlow. And the other way, which is gonna cause a lot of headaches, is to implement the neural network from scratch yourself. So you're gonna have to deal with this back the differentials that keep updating and forth and back and forth and back until you kind of reach an equilibrium. It's much harder with a network than with a perceptron because we don't have that kind of proof for a network. Right. That works for perceptron and we show it for regression where it's a convex objective, but for networks you can get very easily stuck. So that's what's coming in homework three. And Thursday, we're going to discuss these updates on theory, on the board, how they work.